I'm delighted to welcome you all to this, which is the 41st talk of our Virtually Speaking series, um, which has featured members of our Latimer community speaking on a very wide range of topics. And I know some of you are regular attendees, I recognize you, um, but if you're interested in catching up on any you've missed, all of our past talks can be seen by going to the video library in the event section of our Latimer Foundation website. And you can also find the link in the chat now. Since its launch last July, our Virtually Speaking series has brought together over a thousand households from all over the world. And tonight we're welcoming people from the United States, Canada, Spain and Switzerland. So quite an international gathering. These talks have raised over £22,000 for our Inspiring Minds campaign and we're really grateful to our audiences for their support. As many of you know, this campaign will enable our school to be able to offer bursaries to one in four of our students so that young people from all backgrounds can access the life enhancing education that Latimer offers. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome Latimerian John Drury, who will be speaking about his latest book, Around the World in 80 Plants. I was going to give you a short synopsis of John's career to date and the organizations he's been involved with, but then I realized that that would take up most of the allotted hour. So to pick just a few relevant facts, I can tell you that John has had a long and very influential career at the BBC, producing many primetime science documentaries and series. John is currently a trustee of the Eden Project and the Cambridge Science Centre, an ambassador for the WWF, as well as being a former trustee of the Royal Botanic Gardens, Kew and the Woodland Trust. His first book, Around the World in 80 Trees, was published at critical, critical acclaim even in 2018 and has sold over 120,000 copies in 14 languages. I attended a talk that John gave at Latimer about his first book, and so I know you're in for a fascinating evening tonight. Many of you kindly made a donation when booking, and we're really grateful to you for your support. If you didn't yet have time to do so and would like to support our bursaries appeal, then you can use the link in the chat or go to our website. Your money will go directly to funding a bursary for a young person joining Latimer in September. And I'm really pleased to say that thanks to the amazing support of our Latimer community, one in five of our year seven entrants will be benefiting from a bursary this year and one in three of our sixth form entrants. As well as kindly offering to give this talk, John has offered to personally dedicate and sign a copy of his latest book, Around the World in 80 Plants, for anyone who orders through Latimer. What's more, John has asked that 100% of the purchase price should go to this year's bursaries appeal. So please take advantage of this wonderful offer, buy a copy for yourself, and then a few more to keep in stock. This book will make a fantastic gift for friends and family. You can click on the link, which I think Lynn has put in the chat, or you can place an order by going to the Latimer Foundation shop on our website, or just email Lynn. A few housekeeping rules. Please stay on mute during the presentation so that everyone can hear John clearly. And John is very happy to answer as many questions as time allows. So do drop your questions in the chat and John will answer them at the end. Now, without more ado, I'd like to hand over to John for tonight's talk on Around the World in 80 Plants. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm going to uh, try and share my screen and we'll see what happens. Um, uh, and I need uh, one of the team, uh, Lynn perhaps or Amanda, if you could just tell me that that's the, uh, the correct view that you're, you're seeing there. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, uh, so um, uh, it, it, you know, as I said, timing is difficult with Zoom. I'll probably talk for about forty-five minutes, um, and uh, it's very disturbing indeed to have uh, my ex-chemistry uh, teacher on, on the call. Um, uh, I feel like a naughty schoolboy already. <laughs> um, let me see if I can, uh, I can uh, uh, make this uh, make this work. Sorry, I've got some. Uh, little has 
like we need to do here. So uh, first of all, does that work? Laser pointer? Are you seeing that? Yeah, good. Yeah, okay. yeah seeing that. Okay, and uh, we just need to alter something here. Okay, so um, it, normally, of course, uh, you know, if I'm making great claims for plants and things, then uh, I would give references, but uh, you don't want refer academic references tonight. Um, so uh, that email address will give you the references if you, if you don't believe anything I say. Um, uh, and some of it is pretty unbelievable, I think. Um, and uh, I'll give that address at the end as well. Um, so this is me with my dad at Kew Gardens um, when I was about seven, and you can tell that he's a, uh, an immigrant to the country because he's wearing a suit to go to Kew Gardens on a Saturday afternoon uh, to look posh. And one of the ways that I got interested in plants was my father taking me around Kew and feeding me bits of them and telling me the stories about them. And he told me about a plant called Diffenbachia, which you probably know, which is a, a pot plant, which is rather poisonous, but was used as a, um, uh, a punishment during the slave trade. Uh, and it's how he, he broached the subject of slavery with me. And he also fed me a bit of this plant. Um, this is an opium poppy. And I remember having a lick of this and um, it making my, my tongue go ever so slightly numb. And uh, I, it had most effect actually on my, my uh, primary school teacher when I told her, who I think um, had a word with social services who turned up at my, <laughs> my door uh, while I was at school um, in the following week and talked to my mum. But, uh, but it was this sort of multi-sensory kind of approach to education that, um, uh, that inspired me really. And um, uh, over the years, I had more and more of a chance to um, uh, to, to look at the sort of amazing diversity of plants and uh, experience them for in, you know, uh, with, with different senses. Uh, the taste of pandanus fruit in Papua New Guinea, the, the feel of this quiver tree, the, the, the kind of ridiculous, um, I was going to say design, that's a word you have to avoid with American audiences, but the amazing evolution of this uh, wax palm in Colombia and so on. Um, uh, and the the kind of fantastic variety, um, can, you know, just always impressed itself on me. This this is a, a coastal redwood. Uh, this is the the tallest species of tree in the world. Not not that particular example. That's my wife at the bottom there. Um, and and these tiny mosses and so on. Um, uh, the just the the sheer variety of shapes and forms uh, is when you look at it just it absolutely extraordinary. This is the world's largest flower, Rafflesia, um, in Indonesia. This is a, a variety of ginger that grows uh, in Thailand. Um, and, and there's yours truly with uh, what um, uh, Wellwich, the uh, botanist, uh, Austrian botanist described as the ugliest plant in the world. That's in, in Namibia. And one of the things that uh, I, I came across uh, was this sort of feeling that people um, really just don't look at plants uh, in the way that, that we're programmed in a way to look at animals. Um, you know, human beings are, are programmed to, to see things that move. And uh, I, was, I was up in the Andes with a, an expedition with Q and I saw this bird, not this actual bird, but, but of the same species, uh, which is the world's largest hummingbird. And it's about the size of size of your fist or so. Um, uh, amazing, amazing thing. And I was watching it um, and uh, I called one of the botanists over and, and said, shh, look at this, this is amazing. And he, he, he sort of looked at me, he said, oh gosh, it is amazing. It'll be fantastic when that bloody bird gets out of the way. And for him, uh, you know, he was animal blind, but most of us are, are plant blind. And we, we don't, um, uh, we don't sort of think about all the things that plants have to do uh, when they're just sort of rooted to the spot. Um, they have to feed, defend, reproduce themselves, and not be, uh, well, and, and and they're unable to move. So, here's a, here's a question for you: Pot plants just get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Without you really having to top up the soil, and uh, you know that is the miracle of photosynthesis. Um, the, the 
the stuff that plants have, are made of um, doesn't primarily come out of the ground. Because if it did, then you would have to top up the soil, right? Um, so the question is, you know, where does all the stuff come from that makes this plant? Um, and the level of the soil hasn't gone down at all. So if you ask people, they'll mostly say uh, the stuff that plants are made of comes out of the soil. And it seems such an obvious thing. Um, but uh, the miracle of photosynthesis is that there are two ingredients for plants. Uh, uh, you know, the, there's some extra nutrients and little bits and pieces and things that you add with your baby bio. But the absolutely two fundamental ingredients for plants, the stuff that you can kick, is water that comes up through the roots and carbon dioxide gas that comes through the leaves from the air. And carbon dioxide is actually quite heavy. Okay, so um, uh, one of the reasons that people don't think that plants are made out of carbon dioxide gas is because they think that gas can't be heavy. But uh, as Chris Hammond knows, and as Chris Hammond taught me, <laughs> carbon dioxide is heavy stuff. So if you don't believe me, if you need any more convincing, here's Spanish moss or Tillandsia. Um, it's not actually a moss, it's not actually Spanish. Um, and it's a cousin of the pineapple, uh, which, uh, and, and this particular plant grows hanging on, on trees in the American deep south. Uh, it's very much got the look and feel of Gone with the Wind, which is appropriate really, because it's an air plant, an epiphyte. Um, it doesn't have roots that go into the tree. The extra nutrients it needs, um, uh, just sort of, uh, you know, maybe the, you know, other than carbon dioxide and, and water, may come from dust in the air or maybe the odd bird dropping. It's very odd curly stuff. It used to be used uh, for stuffing mattresses and car seats. It looks like uh, they got a bit over enthusiastic with this car. Um, and as you can see, it even grows on electricity wires in midair, no soil needed. There's an example of a uh, a plant growing perfectly well without any soil. I'm, I'm going to just uh, intersperse what I have to say with a few readings from the book. Um, and when I do so, some, some of the time, you'll see these fantastic drawings by Lucille Clerc, who is a, uh, a, an utterly French, <laughs> utterly French um, artist living in London. An eerily iconic plant of the swampy southern states it has skeletal finger length leaves that curl together into chains, forming elongated gray green curtains that drape from trees and telephone wires. Victorian travelers to the deep south wrote melodramatically of trees that swept the cobwebs from the sky or appeared to them as witches weeping in the moonlight. It is indeed a strange plant. Spanish moss is used to stuff hoodoo dolls charms believed to ward off evil and bring good fortune to oneself, or more rarely, misfortune to another. Hoodoo is a spiritual offshoot of Louisiana voodoo, a system of beliefs that developed in the southern states from the traditions of the West African diaspora transported there in the 18th century. The link with hoodoo talismans contributes to the plant's creepy reputation. But the people who craft those dolls may be playing on more primitive emotions. Perhaps Spanish moss and the swamps it inhabits embody nature untamed, rampant, and beyond our control. So water carries chemicals around the plant um, and keeps tissues sort of uh, turgid and so on. But remember, it's also one of the two vital ingredients in photosynthesis, so it's got this double role in plants. And plants will do anything to get water. Most striking is uh, when water is short, so in, in, in deserts. Uh, this is the dragon tree of Socotra, uh, which is an island off the coast of Yemen. And you can see that uh, it funnels water to the center. Any kind of dew or, or rain that there is uh, drips uh, through these wonderfully uh, bifurcated um, branches down to the middle. This cactus, in common with most cacti, has a, a, a means of photosynthesis, which is very clever. Um, it takes in carbon dioxide uh, during the night and, uh, and then uh, transforms it into chemicals that it can store 
until the next day when it can use them for photosynthesizing when the sun is out. And the reason that it does this is so that it doesn't have to have its little pores, its stomata open during, during the day um, when it, it, you know, it would lose water through those tiny little holes by evaporation. It's very, very clever means of photosynthesis. And then there's this, which is the aloe vera, which you're probably very familiar with. Um, uh, if you take a bite out of aloe vera, uh, it's got this incredibly bitter outer uh, layer just underneath the, uh, the, the, the sort of skin that you can see here, um, which used to be used for sort of uh, coating children's fingernails so they didn't bite them. Uh, but the way it stores water is, is within this armored leaf, which is very bitter so that the animals don't come along and eat it. And um, it, it's stored as a gel. Uh, very, very uh, in interesting way that it's, it's done that. And here's a plant with a very special relationship with water, uh, tiny sphagnum moss. Uh, this, this is the stuff of bogs in Ireland and, uh, and, and northern latitudes, northern Scotland and so on, rarely even reaching ankle height, but very beautiful if you look at it. And it's, it provides one of the most important ecosystems actually. Uh, across the subarctic in waterlogged places where rain is frequent, lovely sort of muted palette, and a wonderful uh, air gun mechanism that uh, manages to reach twice the pressure in a car tire in its little tiny um, spore capsules uh, before ejecting them. Um, incredible acceleration just above the level where um, the, the breeze can catch it. And um, Sphagnum is a, is a clever old plant because it manipulates its environment to suit itself while sabotaging competitors. So it creates these areas of stagnant water, starved of any dissolved oxygen, and it extracts much more in the way of nutrients than it actually needs for its own survival. And it sequesters them um, in, inside itself, not even using them, but leaving precious little for others. And it has this cunning chemistry that makes bog, bog water very, very uh, discouraging to most plants and most, most microorganisms as well, um, which means that things don't decay in the bog. And you've probably seen pictures like this. This is Tolland Man from Denmark, um, incredibly well-preserved, centuries and centuries and centuries old, um, and uh, you know, with, with no uh, bacteria living in the, in the water or fungi um, to, to make it degrade. Uh, to make the body degrade. Absolutely extraordinary uh, and, and rather creepy uh, detail. Um, sphagnum has these special cells that retain liquids and uh, in the First World War um, there were these packs of, of sphagnum that were used for surgical dressings and in sanitary towels and of course these were remarkably sterile so it was a fantastic wound dressing and there were moss drives for the war effort in the UK and Canada and because it doesn't decay very well dead sphagnum settles and under pressure accretes to, to sort of form peat and uh, that's a forerunner of coal and the deepest bogs are more than 10,000 years old threatened unfortunately now by forestry and people extracting it for power generation god help us and, uh, and improving garden soil, uh, which is all very myopic because the world's peat bogs have captured more than twice the amount of carbon stored in all the tropical rainforests for combined. So if water is one half of the photosynthesis equation, the other half is carbon dioxide. And um, uh, there's a fabulous variety of leaf shapes. Uh, just, just sort of these ridiculous things like the traveler's palm in Madagascar, which looks like a radio antenna to this ugly thing, the well witcher of Namibia and, and you know, all these things. This, this leaf um, uh, has evolved to have a drip tip so that it keeps the, uh, the leaf nice and dry and free from infection and so on and so on. Uh, just amazing, amazing, fabulous variety. And they've all evolved to fill a particular environmental niche, but they've all evolved to absorb carbon dioxide from the air and each leaf is a fantastic chemical factory. Um, so uh, here's, here's another one of my favorites. Um, 
uh, with all sorts of strong links to water. This is the, the, the lotus. Now, if any of you have spent any time in, in South or Southeast Asia, you will now be going misty eyed because the, the lotus is the thing that makes every Southeast Asian person go completely gooey at the, at the thought. Um, it's just about all parts of the plant are edible, which helps and actually rather delicious. Um, it grows in water, um, often in quite murky water. Uh, the seed head, uh, I love this, it sort of looks like a shower head, isn't it? <laughs> but these seeds are edible as well. And uh, it's got an amazing underwater breathing system for the roots, uh, which works on sort of temperature differentials. But what I, what I really like about this, because I was originally an engineer, um, is that it's got this incredible capacity for shrugging off water. So water is, is one of these substances that likes a, uh, sticking to itself is the way I put it, but it has this molecular cohesion property of sort of forming globules on the right kind of surface, it pulls itself together. And the, the, you've noticed that on your Gore-Tex jacket, I'm sure. Um, uh, and, and the Gore-Tex jacket is a copy of the lotus leaf, which has these very, very tiny nanoscale dimples on it, which prevent the water from spreading out on the surface and, and sort of wetting the surface. And um, instead, the water forms these, these sort of slushes around on the surface of the leaf. And as it slushes around, um, uh, it, uh, it cleans the leaf of dust and fungal spores and general detritus. Uh, and this is called the lotus effect and is being used now on glass, uh, self-cleaning windows in, in buildings and so on. And in Hinduism, uh, Lakshmi, the goddess uh, Lakshmi, is, uh, is generally depicted on a, a couch, as you can see, of a lotus flower. You see the similarity there. And uh, also holding lotus blossoms. There you go. There she is. Uh, denoting purity because the, the lotus keeps itself pure, but also wealth and fertility. And uh, in, in other religions, uh, you have a, a similar, uh, similar thing going on. Um, so I'll just read you. Um, uh, it, in Buddhism, by tradition, lotus plants sprouted in the first footsteps of Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, and a common mantra among Tibetan Buddhists, Om Mani Padme Hum draws together the lotus with enlightenment and inestimable worth in one hypnotically repeated Sanskrit phrase. The lotus, perfect and unsullied by the muddy waters in which it grows, with glittering beads of water that dance and sparkle jewel-like in the center of its leaves, symbolizes the spiritual journey towards light and wisdom. Um, so I'm going to go straight into another reading now because we're still on the subject of photosynthesis um, because it is the most important chemical reaction in the world and um, uh, read you a little piece about marine phytoplankton and this is a, um, another of the beautiful illustrations that Lucille Clerc uh, has done. Microscopic single-celled organisms may not fit everyone's definition of a plant but a plant's most important capability is to photosynthesize, and phytoplankton certainly do that. Most of them live for just a few days, drifting on ocean currents suspended near the surface where there's light. Using sunshine to power the process, phytoplankton consume carbon dioxide dissolved in seawater and incorporate carbon compounds into their tiny bodies, just as carbon is stored by the wood and leaves of a tree. They may be small, but they're abundant. A tablespoon of seawater may contain hundreds of thousands of individuals. Together, the world's marine phytoplankton absorb as much carbon dioxide and give off as much oxygen as all the trees and every other land plant combined. They're also the ocean's primary producers, the first link in the food chain. Without them, hardly any other sea life would be possible. Phytoplankton are typically the width of a fine hair, but can be much smaller. Magnification reveals a parallel universe of intricate structures, the stuff of acid dreams, solitary spaceships and implausibly geometric shapes, minute snakes and ladders and garlands of elaborate beads on infinitesimal threads. There are thousands of different species. So still on the subject of photosynthesis, here's a plant you might know. Uh, this is mare's tail. Uh, equisetum, it's sometimes called a horse's tail, is very, very abrasive. There are silicates 
uh, which are sand-like uh, chemicals um, uh, in, in the uh, leaves and stems. And uh, it's often used in Japan actually for uh, polishing furniture um, or, um, uh, or, or even for um, uh, sculpting clarinet reeds. Uh, in, in traditional Native American tradition, it's been used to treat urinary and urinary tract infections. Um, it's not great to eat because uh, the, the grit and, and sand in it will, uh, will um, wear down your teeth pretty fast. It's a very, very primitive plant. So primitive uh, that 360 million years ago, um, the big brothers of this plant, Calamites, which are extinct now, um, were, you know, very, very, very widespread on, on the planet. And they're massive, massive trees, 50 meters high. They didn't rot. Um, and one of the reasons they didn't rot, uh, there's scientific debate about this, but it's quite probably because bacteria and fungi hadn't worked out yet, hadn't evolved to break down lignin, which is what that sort of woody stuff in, in, in plants. And they took about another 60 million years to do that. And that period between 360 million years ago and about 300 million years ago is called the Carboniferous period. And it's called that uh, because that's when all the carbon deposits, uh, all the world's coal was formed in that period. And from a climate change point of view, that's obviously rather important um, uh, because it, these plants took all the carbon dioxide out of the air and uh, they didn't rot. Um, uh, which would have released the carbon back into back, carbon dioxide back into the air. Now, uh, it, from a climate change view point of view, it's best to leave that coal where it is, um, rather than releasing all those millions of years worth of carbon dioxide by burning it. Um, now, nowadays, dead wood does rot, and when it does, carbon dioxide goes back into the atmosphere, and so building lots of wooden framed um, buildings is definitely a good idea, and so of course is. Uh, <laughs> is buying books which are made out of wood um, uh, which sequesters lots of carbon so there you go <laughs> um, so uh, having uh, fed themselves um, plants unable to move anywhere have to defend themselves too and uh, you know when a uh, when when a, a herbivore uh, whether it's a, an insect or or a, or a mammal or anything else looks at a scene like this uh, they think lunch and there are many, many ways that plants have, uh, uh, that have, they've evolved to defend themselves. Um, the, there's the tannin in oak trees that sort of disrupts the digestion. There's two-part poisons in cherry laurel that are innocuous each on their own, but you champ the leaf and it makes cyanide. Uh, there's caffeine, which we'll come to in, in coffee, which does some quite interesting things to defend the plant. There's manchineal, which every part of it is just so horribly, horribly poisonous and caustic, you don't want to go anywhere near it. There are all the spines and things, pachypodium here in Madagascar. Um, these, these spines are absolutely like needles. Um, you know, you can't walk through a, a thicket of these uh, without being covered in blood. And here's one that I particularly love. I gave a, call, uh, a, a talk, would you believe, to GCHQ, and uh, the, the, the room went strangely silent when I talked about this. Um, you might think that this is uh, some sort of poison that I'm going to talk about that, uh, you know, uh, dispatched whatever it was, uh, of the caterpillar that was eating this leaf. But no, no, this contains pheromones that attract the thing that eats the caterpillar. Uh, very, very clever, very clever. Um, now, here's a particularly well-defended plant, and wherever you go around the world in uh, places where cacti grow, in sort of um, arid environments, people think that this is a local plant. Um, and they think that because, unfortunately, it's been spread around the world. But the reason it got spread around the world is quite an interesting story. So this is prickly pear or opuntia. You might know it as the sabra. Um, and uh, you might associate it with the Middle East, but actually it's native to Mexico. Um, the Aztecs uh, uh, called it Tionochtli, which is, means goddess of the sun, um, uh, after these fantastic flowers that it has. Um, the, the fruit are edible, uh, though, can we just be honest about it? They're just not that nice. Uh, <laughs> there isn't quite the right amount of acid in it to make it sort of punch. It's just a bit sort of sickly and, and, and dull. Uh, the pads are rather good, uh, and these pads 
um, are not actually the leaves. The leaves are what look to us like these thorns, and they're specially adapted leaves. And these pads are really the stems. Uh, but there's much, much more to the prickly pear. And it, in Mexico, it's culturally so important that it's on their national flag. Here it is, there, right in the middle uh, is the prickly pear. Uh, what's going on? Well, the Aztecs cultivated this plant um, as a source of red dye, and it's still cultivated for that. Um, so you, you go to Mexico, you can still see people um, uh, with, uh, with red dye that has come from the plant. But the, the dye comes not exactly from the plant, but from these little beetles called cochineal beetles. Uh, you've probably heard of, but you might not realize um, all that goes into harvesting and cultivating cochineal. So you have these tiny little uh, beetles that are you know, um, about half the size of a, a, a pinky fingernail. And uh, they surround themselves with this sort of uh, white waxy exudation really, um, partly to camouflage themselves possibly, though they don't seem to be doing that very well, um, and partly uh, to protect themselves from ultraviolet light. And uh, the uh, Aztecs, when the Spanish arrived, the Aztecs already had plantations like this. Um, with, this is a modern one. Um, and, the, and the Spanish reported on these. Um, uh, and they'd been cultivating and breeding these beetles uh, to grow especially well on, um, uh, on, on the prickly pear. Uh, and they're quite finicky little insects. And they, they managed to breed those. And basically, they... Um, you know, you, you kill the insects by dunking them in boiling water and then grind them up and that's how you get cochineal. Um, the, uh, the Spanish were absolutely stunned when they arrived by all these fabrics in bright colour fast scarlet because Europe had nothing that was quite as colour fast and scarlet robes were associated with nobility because that, they were so, so rare and difficult to get hold of the dyes. And after silver and gold, cochineal became the most valuable export, export from Mexico by a long way. And it was used by royalty. Spain protected their secret source for probably 200 years. But eventually everyone got in, in on it. The Star Spangled Banner, the original Star Spangled Banner was dyed with cochineal. Um, Cromwell chose cochineal for the dye for soldiers' uniforms. And that meant that it got planted all over the world. And the Europeans who planted it in their colonies of course, couldn't, they couldn't plant it in Europe because cacti don't grow very well in Europe, but uh, they planted it all over the colonies. And in 1788, the governor of New South Wales in Australia introduced it. Uh, vast areas of arid lands, perfect. What could possibly go wrong? Well, these finicky insects that they brought over to, for their cochineal industry that they were going to have in Australia, they, um, they'd been bred by the Aztecs to work really well in Mexico, and they didn't really travel very well and they um, they couldn't live in Australia and so with nothing to eat it the cactus absolutely spread like wildfire and um, this is a cartoon from the time but by 1925 a hundred thousand square miles can you imagine a hundred thousand square miles of valuable grazing lands were covered with prickly pear and people tried slashing it and burning it and thousands of tons of ghastly um, arsenic compounds were dumped on it, and nothing worked. And eventually, probably the most important biocontrol project ever, three billion eggs of an encouragingly named Mexican moth, here it is, um, called Cactoblastis cactorum, <laughs> um, were introduced. And they'd evolved in Mexico just to dine out on prickly pears, and they did travel. So that largely solved the problem in Australia after a few decades, um, except of course those moths have now spread around the world and they're attacking other cacti. Um, if you go to Australia you'll find places like this, this is the, <laughs> I love the name of this, this is the Cactoblastis Memorial Hall in Boonaga in uh, Queensland and there are lots of other monuments around Australia. And nowadays, uh, Mexican cochineal is actually making a bit of a comeback because people are sort of wanting to move away from synthetic dyes. And so it's still uh, Gaspar Campari, who invented the drink in 1868, used cochineal. Um, but it's still used in some parts of the world, not in the UK version of Campari and not in the US, as far as I know. Uh, but in some other countries around the world, if you look at the ingredients, it says carmine 
on it, which you often see also on the ingredients on lipsticks. And carmine, uh, there's an E number for it, which I can't remember, but carmine is the clue uh, that it is actually made from cochineal beetles. Wonderful, wonderful story of, um, of, of, uh, of, of bio control and not introducing um, plants around the world without careful thought and management. So here's another plant with an interesting defense. Um, this is the castor oil plant or castor bean and it originated in the Horn of Africa around um, Ethiopia, Djibouti, Eritrea kind of region. And it was brought to Italy by the Romans. Uh, very popular in civic gardens nowadays. And each prickly capsule here has three shiny seeds, um, which I shall be able to show you, yep. Um, the intricate pattern is probably uh, to camouflage them from rodents. And um, the seeds have a very interesting relationship with ants. Uh, this, this little bit on the end here um, is actually not a functional part of the seed. The, the plant doesn't need it in order to grow, but it's very oil rich, nutrient rich. And ants um, uh, come and take the seed away to their nest and uh, strip off this bit, the, which is called the eliosome, and they um, uh, feed that to their you know, ant babies. And they throw away the rest of the seed, which is completely viable, um, onto the ant uh, sort of refuse heap. And that is uh, full of fantastic nutrients and things for the plant. Um, uh, so uh, the plants grow particularly well near, near ant heaps in, in the wild. And that, that process of ant distribution of seeds has the most wonderful name, which is called myrmecockery. Myrmecockery, I think, is just a, a, a sort of beautiful, beautiful word. Um, now, th this, these are members of the euphorbia family, and the euphorbias contain some pretty nasty chemicals. Um, uh, and one of them is uh, a, an absolutely deadly poison uh, called ricin, and, and half of one thousandth of a gram can kill. Uh, and in 1978, um, Georgi Markov, uh, who was a Bulgarian dissident in London, was killed with a capsule which was the size of a pinhead, which was injected into him with a poisoned umbrella. It's very James Bond. This, um, uh, it's um, uh, you know, and they they the the they managed to sort of find that's what had killed him. Um, but a tiny, tiny amount, if it gets into your bloodstream. Um, but the, the seeds that you're, you're probably uh, aware of, obviously, are made into um, oil, uh, which used to be uh, a, a sort of a mildish laxative, um, in, at least in small quantities, for, uh, for children. And concerned, concerned parents used to administer a, a teaspoonful or two of, of, of um, this awful oil, which tastes like uh, lipstick and soap and petroleum jelly, jelly and um, you know all sorts. Thankfully, it's out of vogue now. Um, but uh, the the poison doesn't survive the oil making process. So this this stuff was a horrible laxative, <laughs> but um, didn't didn't survive the oil process. But this was also used by Mussolini's fascist thugs. Um, uh, here is a, uh, a, a badge um, of, the, uh, uh, of, of the time. This is the 1920s, I think, and 30s. Um, uh, which would you choose, it says, Quale de due, uh, which of the two, olio or a club, uh, you know, as a weapon? And, and they used, uh, this olio was uh, olio di ricino, that's the um, uh, rice in, uh, you know, oil. Um, which uh, was, a, a, it, it was a, a, this use as a laxative, uh, which they administered to um, sometimes fatally torture political opponents. And, uh, it, you know, it was a sort of humiliating thing and also uh, often fatal. And uh, so the same plant, which has memories for, our, uh, for us or our grandparents as being a kind of, um, you know, good natured parenting kind of thing like this, um, it, in, in Italy still, nowadays, um, the phrase usare il olio di ricino means to use, literally to use castor oil, but is used as a, as a, as a idiom, meaning to coerce or abuse. And um, just mentioning this plant to Italian people has a completely other resonance.
Um, here's tobacco. Uh, notice the, the um, typical uh, flower shape of the Solanum family, which is very much like tomatoes, potatoes, deadly nightshade, um, uh, all sorts of things which are quite feisty actually. And the, the plant has these trichomes, these, these little hairs, which exude a sort of sticky substance containing nicotine, which is the plant's defense against uh, attack from insects. And it's a very, very effective poison. Um, it's, um, uh, originally, it's native to uh, Bolivia, transported throughout the Americas by indigenous people, uh, used ritually, um, and then became, of course, huge business. And the huge business was built on slavery. Um, so mid 18th century, uh, 18, 000, sorry, mid 18th century, 140,000 enslaved people, uh, mainly in Virginia and Maryland, um, uh, you know, owned uh, uh, terribly sadly by the tobacco aristocracy, uh, including the US founding fathers, uh, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. Um, uh, all very, very sad part of tobacco's history. Uh, and of course, tobacco, is a highly addictive habit, um, which is a brilliant, brilliant business model if you can sell people something that's very uh, addictive. Massively profitable for um, uh, the directors and shareholders of tobacco companies. Uh, yet tobacco has killed and maimed more people than any other plant and uses 15,000 square miles of the Earth's surface that could otherwise be used um, to grow food or set aside to conserve a forest. And I, I marvel at the mental gymnastics of uh, people, intelligent, well-funded people in the tobacco industry who lose, use all that wealth and lobbying power to present themselves and their companies as model corporate citizens. Don't get me started on the oil industry. <laughs> uh, well, do get me started, but not now. Um, and here's the mandrake. You might think that, uh, so mandrake is another one of these Solanum families. Look at the typical flower here. Um, uh, and you might think that uh, the mandrake representing Italy again, um, that uh, is, is a mythical plant or something out of Hogwarts, but it's a very real plant. Uh, and here it is. And it's got all sorts of occult associations. Um, uh, the, the root looks like a person. Um, especially with a bit of judicious whittling, it has to be said. Um, the story went that the scream of the mandrake uh, was so distressing that a man would die if he heard it, and therefore you'd tie a dog to the mandrake root and scare, scare the dog away to, um, to pull the mandrake root out. And the reason that people wanted the mandrake root was because mixed with wine, it was one of the very few things they could use as an anesthetic. And it, it was incredibly valuable as that so valuable that those occult associations and the screaming of the dog and all that were quite possibly rumors put about by people who um, wanted to make sure that people didn't come and steal this incredibly valuable plant. Notice how much they look like tomatoes, these. Um, I, I'm just going to uh, read you a little bit about the mandrake. Several 14th and 15th century accounts describe witches' salves made from mandrake and other psychoactive plants pounded together with grease. Such ointments hasten the absorption of the hallucinogenic drugs in mandrake through the skin and especially through the body's mucous membranes. One substance, hyacine, is known often to impart a convincing sensation of flying which plausibly explains why so many medieval woodcuts depict nude or partially clothed witches airborne and straddling broomsticks, an idea that still has common currency. Although Mandrake's use as an anaesthetic ended with the introduction of ether and chloroform in the mid 19th century, some of its other ancient associations live on. In the 1930s, one of the first comic book superheroes was Mandrake the Magician. And in the 1960s, a sedative pill called Mandrax, among many chemically similar products, was the one brand that became associated with promiscuous sex. And today, at least one commercial fragrance uses the name Mandragora to simultaneously conjure helpless abandon and beguiling agency, just as it has for millennia. Mandragora is the scientific name for Mandrake. And um, here's coffee. And, and coffee, uh, you know, is so familiar and yet I think there are aspects of coffee that are very unfamiliar. 
And I, I'm just going to uh, read you uh, another little piece about, um, uh, or two short extracts about, about coffee. The little evergreen coffee tree began life somewhere near the forested mountains of southwestern Ethiopia, and its broad elliptical leaves with crinkled edges, shiny and dark above and pastel pale underneath, still prefer the shade. In full flower, coffee is a spellbinding but ephemeral joy. For just a couple of days, thousands of delicate white blossoms with a light fragrance of honeysuckle and jasmine can festoon a single tree. The smoothly oval fruits ripen to pillar box red, their thin layer of edible flesh tastes of watermelon and apricot and surrounds a pair of deeply grooved seeds that are the familiar coffee beans. The coffee tree didn't develop caffeine for our benefit. When its leaves die and drop, their caffeine leaches into the soil, impeding the germination and growth of competing plants. And it's also a defense, sometimes a lethal one, against various insects and fungi. It is therefore surprising that coffee and even some unrelated citrus plants put caffeine in their nectar, which after all is meant to reward insects for ferrying pollen to other plants. It turns out that the merest dash of caffeine below the threshold that bees can sense, helps them to remember the plant, making them more likely to return to it. The flowers shrewdly dispense just enough caffeine to be pharmacologically active, but not enough to be bothersome. And I, I love the way that so many different cultures have developed caffeine rituals. In, in Ethiopia, it's very, very baroque you know and you get um you know they sort of uh, roast it with cardamom and they give you popcorn with it and you know i mean that and frankincense and myrrh you know in the air and everything but you know every culture has this sort of nerdy caffeine ritual either with coffee plant or with tea or with with other things that contain caffeine i think it's very sweet and um in, uh, you know, of course, the coffee houses were places in Britain that people did business in the 18th century, as opposed to chocolate, which was much more uh, a place where men and women could mix. Um, this, this sort of, uh, you know, bring, brings us on to, to reproduction. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've talked about the sort of the, the food that plants need, the defense they need, and of course they need to make baby plants. So uh, one of the ways that plants make baby plants um, is, is by vegetative reproduction, by sort of taking a, a bit of yourself and cloning yourself. But another way which has the advantage of, of uh, making you less vulnerable to disease and so on, because your progeny will be different from yourself, is to have sexual reproduction. And the main way of doing that is by um, uh, encouraging something to take your pollen uh, to somewhere else. And you can either get the wind to do that, which is rather inefficient because you have to throw, throw some of it everywhere, hoping that it lands in the right place. Or you can get an insect to take your pollen, which contains the male sex cells to the female parts of another plant. And the natural world is full of amazing plant animal interactions uh, to enable this to happen. And here's the tomato. Um, so uh, another member of this feisty Solanum family, don't go eating tomato plants, they're not very good for you, except the fruit, which we've bred to be not poisonous. Um, and uh, the, the bees, uh, not just any old bees, but bumblebees, um, uh, have co-evolved with tomato plants so that they, uh, as they approach the, uh, the plant, uh, the, the flower, um, the flower will only release, release its pollen when there's a buzz of the right frequency, uh, so which sort of resonates the, the anther to drop the pollen. And so the, as the bumblebee approaches, it changes its wing beat from the beat of normal flight up to a, a sort of middle C and then clamps itself to the flower and beats its wings at the middle C and the flower dumps its pollen all over it. Very, very clever. Um, and uh, that's not the only thing about tomatoes and sound. So I'm not quite sure, in fact, I, you know, it amazes me that people discovered this, but scientists in Korea within the last two years um, have discovered that if you play loud sound to green tomatoes, um, uh, it delays their ripening. And you can, if you, if you play a high C for about um, uh, six hours, 
you can delay the ripening of tomatoes by several days, even up to six or seven days. And that's actually very valuable for farmers um, because uh, you don't want a glut all at once. You know, you want your crop to be to be spread out in terms of ripening. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, at the moment they use all sorts of uh, plant hormones and things to delay ripening or to to trigger ripening. Um, and sound looks as if it'll be another weapon in the in the ripening arsenal. Um, just a, a kind of extraordinary thing, and you think, how on earth did they discover that? Um, this flower uh, is the is the peacock flower, um, and why it's called the peacock flower, I don't know. Probably named by people who hadn't seen peacocks before, because peacocks are blue, aren't they? Um, but this is the peacock flower of Barbados. Um, this yellow against orange colouring. Um, uh, encourages a relationship with the butterfly and discourages the relationship with hummingbirds. And you might think, well, why are plants having to sort of specialize? And uh, actually you get better pollination, more efficient pollination, if you get two species that kind of depend on each other. Um, and, you know, you can, uh, one relies on the, um, uh, you know, the other one to carry the pollen and the, the, the other relies on, on the plant to, uh, to give it the nectar. And you get this very tight relationship which leads for better pollination. So the, the, the peacock flower has this yellow um, uh, yellow patch um, sort of uh, at the top of the, the, the nectar tube um, which is, is particularly attractive to butterflies, yellow against orange, um, less so with hummingbirds. It, it makes its nectar at the time of day when the, the butterflies are around and the, the um, the hummingbirds aren't, and it has a, the, it's grown this to just the length which um, uh, hummingbirds don't like and butterflies do. Very clever stuff. But I'm just going to read you a little piece about the peacock flower. Um, I'm just looking at the time, and yeah, we're okay. Well, um, I think probably about another five minutes. That's all. Um, so the peacock flower is exuberant but tinged with sadness too. Its seeds contain poisons that have been used by tribespeople in the region, uh, that's the Caribbean region, to induce abortion as a means of family planning. During the era of slavery, captive women who were expected to produce children in order to enhance the future wealth of plantations resorted to those seeds to abort their babies, preventing them from being born into a humiliating life of backbreaking, backbreaking cruelty. In 2018, for her royal wedding to Prince Harry, Meghan Markle's spectacular flowing veil was embroidered with distinctive flora of each nation of the British Commonwealth. Representing Barbados, the peacock flower was a poignant reminder of the slave trade and somberly resonant with the Duchess of Sussex's own ancestry. And uh, the, the final plant that I wanted to talk about is, is nutmeg. Um, uh, uh, you know, so at last, you know, the plant has produced its seeds, which are the next generation. It needs to find a way of making sure that those seeds don't compete with the mother tree. In this case, um, this bright red aril um, attracts nutmeg pigeons that come along and, and uh, gobble up the seeds and then um, deposit them with uh, appropriate amount of uh, fertilizer somewhere else. Um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the nutmeg um, uh, reached Europe in, in the 13th century or so. Uh, Arab traders kept its source a secret for a very long time. Um, and uh, it's expensive, it's desirable, it enlivens boring food, but it, has other, it had other properties as well, which were very attractive. Um, Leonardo da Vinci in 1510, for his trip to Padua, um, included a list of reminders to himself. Um, they included, I'm just going to read it, Spectacles with case, penknife, sheets of paper, scalpel, acquire a skull, nutmeg. <laughs> it's lovely. And uh, you're probably aware that fighting for control over nutmeg went on and on between the Dutch and the British and the French uh, for centuries. And in 1667, the British finally gave up their claim um, on the island of Run, which is the main source of nutmeg in what is now Indonesia. And they gave up the claim from the Dutch in return for a hopeless little Dutch outpost in North America. And that little Dutch outpost, which was traded, traded for nutmeg rights, was Manhattan. <laughs> um, uh, 
Um, in 18th century, um, nutmegs were rumoured to spice up physical desire and performance. And uh, gentlemen used to go around with, um, uh, you know, these little nutmeg graters to uh, use um, uh, when they needed to. And uh, they would grate this into drink and so on. And there was a little compartment for the nutmegs themselves. Lovely items there uh, from the 18th century. And uh, of course, all this meant that the, you know, very difficult to get hold of, all sorts of medicinal properties that people wanted. Um, the price was absolutely sky high. Um, I'm going to um, just read you a final little bit about nutmeg, which is something you may not know about nutmeg. A little nutmeg is a warming delight, but a whole seed or two in one go is dangerously narcotic and widely reported to be hallucinogenic. One would need to be desperate for a high though, since the side effects, vomiting, confusion, dizziness and heart arrhythmia are discouraging. It has only ever been a psychoactive drug of last resort. The African-American activist Malcolm X wrote in his autobiography about using nutmeg in jail in the 1940s. It was later banned from prison kitchens in the United States to avoid misuse, and generations of students have tried and generally failed to achieve a cheap and rewarding nutmeg high. The most common misuses of nutmeg nowadays are to powder it too far in advance of use or to heat it for too long. Both culinary crimes destroy its precious but fugitive flavor. Nutmeg should be grated respectfully at the end of cooking. That way, even boiled rice pudding can be a pleasure. So I'll finish, um, you know, this, this is uh, the pineapple. I could, have, I could tell you about how um, it was so difficult to grow uh, that, um, uh, you know, people used to rent them out at parties <laughs> uh, when they first got, uh, uh, when they were first grown in this country, they were such a rarity. And they got associated with um, everything to do with aristocracy and nobility. And, uh, uh, you know, apart from taking, taking them to soirees uh, on, a, on a sort of, uh, and supporting the rental market, people made these sort of pineapple buildings and you often see pineapples uh, on people's gateposts and things. They were absolutely associated with nobility. Um, today, I've deliberately chosen plants that are familiar, uh, but I hope, um, you know, with one or two surprises for you. Uh, I haven't had time to tell you about the obscure ones, the iboga from Cameroon with its strange initiation rites, the cook pine from the South Pacific, that wherever it grows in the world inexplicably leans towards the equator, the extraordinary tree fuchsia of New Zealand and so on. Um, we do want some time for questions, so I'll just leave you with uh, a sort of final thought, and that is that, you know, plants need food and water, defence. Um, uh, they also need habitats, which means they need some love. So, um, you know, please remember, uh, join, uh, join a, um, an environmental organisation um, and uh, they need your voice just as much as your money. Um, and that's it from me. Thank you uh, very much. If you want to get in, in touch, then uh, you can do so through that web address, that email address, or uh, there's other information on the website. And uh, I think at this point I should stop sharing. I've gone off, gone on long enough. There you go. Is anybody there? <laughs> I'm sure everyone's still here. Wow, John, that was um, that was such a fascinating uh, botanical journey through your uh, through your new book, uh, teaching us about all these amazing plants, uh, their history, the chemicals, uh, and the inse insects that they rely on to to um, survive. So thank you so much. Um, I know we are a little bit short uh, of time, but I would love to um, open up for for any questions. No, um, I think there might be some on the uh, on the chat. Yeah, so let's have yeah. a little look in the chat uh, because um, there are lots of thanks, John, uh, to you for saying um, what a brilliant um, what a brilliant talk. We have a. Um, so there's one here from Campbell Christie, yeah. uh, which says, we use many drugs originating from the plant world, but what advantages do these drugs convey to the plant? Are they all for defense? Um, a lot of them are for defense, actually. So a lot of the things that we use uh, as, um, uh, as drugs uh, are kind of things like um, latexes and resins 
um, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, a, a lot of the early mi antimicrobials uh, were made out of those things, which the plant uses to defend itself from attack. You know, if something slashes or scratches the surface of the plant, then it, it exudes this material to gum up the mouth parts of uh, insects, but also to poison um, bacteria and, and fungi, or at least uh, stop them growing so, so well. So we, we use a lot of those. There are drugs um, that work as uh, painkillers for us, um, which probably also uh, modulate the uh, the way that mammals respond to plants, uh, you know, or, or uh, and sometimes insects. Um, so the opiates, for example, are, are, are pretty much uh, likely to be um, uh, defense chemicals. Um, it, Sometimes there are chemicals in plants that, uh, you know, it's, it's not clear, absolutely clear to us whether they're defense chemicals or not, or whether they're byproducts of something else that the plant is doing that happen to affect us. And the example of that is diosgenin, which is a, um, a, a, a steroid or the, a precursor chemical, as it's called, something that you make steroids from, um, that is uh, present in yams. And Mexican yams uh, enabled the uh, Mexican chemical industry and, uh, to be to absolutely lead the world in the 1940s and 50s with the production of, of human hormones and uh, steroid drugs, which are used nowadays as anti-inflammatories. And uh, in fact, the, the world's first contraceptive pills were based on, on yams. Are there more? Yes, there are. Um... It's a question from Jane saying, is the peacock flower a legume? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I don't think it is. Uh, and um, uh, my reason for thinking that is that it's sort of, uh, the flower structure to me doesn't completely look like a legume. I, I, what I should be doing is quickly uh, Googling for the answer, but I, uh, I, I don't think it is. Um, but I could be completely wrong. While you ask me another question, let's look. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a, um, it's an interesting one here from Joanna as well, saying with nearly 4,000 different species of plants in the world, how did you choose just the 80 for, for your book? Uh, yeah, actually 400,000 um, yes. uh, or so uh, plant species. It was difficult for... Um, uh, oh look, here's a bit of product placement I could do. For around the world in 80 trees, and um, other books are available, um, that was 80 plants, 80 trees out of um, uh, about 60,000 species. Uh, for this, yeah, 80, 80 plants out of um, uh, 400,000, uh, of which about a quarter are trees actually. And I had several criteria. One was, um, uh, you know, there needed to be a good geographic mix around the world. Um, uh, another one uh, was that they needed to be uh, a kind of mix of different kinds of plants, um, you know, sort of some legumes, some trees, some, you know, all sorts of different things. Um, uh, a, a third one was that, uh, and the most important really, was that every story had to have um, both some interesting science in it, and by interesting, I mean something that would be uh, at least a bit surprising for even even for people who work in the field. Some interesting history, maybe some interesting folklore and cultural stuff as well, and certainly some sort of um, aha human stories around them. And uh, you know, it took quite a lot of research to to find things that were new. So I had to look both at, at very old books and also very new scientific literature. And uh, on my short list of about kind of uh, 300 plants got whittled down and whittled down and um, uh, it took me quite a long time to find 80 where I thought do you know what the, you know this this will have something surprising in them so that that was that was how I went about it. Great um, uh, a fun here from um, from Sarah saying hi John and thank you I work for Nando's uh, can you tell me anything to wow my colleagues about the chili we use bird's eyes chilies to make our piri piri. Okay, so uh, two things. One is I've just looked up the um, uh, peacock flower and I think it is a legume, right? So Jane Chaloner, I'm extremely sorry. I had that wrong. Uh, it is. 
um, uh, so and the the question about um, chili peppers. Okay, so two things I'd tell you about chilies. Um, one is that birds uh, that have evolved to um, uh, to to distribute the seeds. So bird in the wild, birds eat chilies, and then. Uh, they poo out the seed somewhere else so that the seed isn't competing with the mother chili plant. Um, and birds don't register capsaicin, which is the chemical in chilies. They don't see them, feel it as being sort of hot and unpleasant uh, in the way that other animals do. So again, the, the plant and the birds have this relationship with each other where they mutually depend on each other and that's an efficient way of getting the seeds um, distributed. Um, there's a there's a plant uh, called Sichuan pepper, um, which is is not chili. Um, it's a completely different other thing. Uh, but I don't know if you've ever tried it. And if you haven't tried it, go buy some uh, and try some. You, uh, I mean, buy the smallest quantity that you you can find in the shop. <laughs> don't get a big sack of it because it'll last a long time. Um, but it's it's a spice that is used in Chinese cooking quite a lot. And it's so common in Chinese cooking that they have a single syllable word um, for uh, the sensation in your mouth that this chemical gives you. And it, you know how mint makes your mouth feel cold, even though it isn't. And capsaicin in chili peppers makes your mouth feel hot, even though it isn't. Well, um, this Sichuan pepper contains a chemical that makes your mouth feel like it's vibrating, even though it's not. So you get this sort of buzzing sensation. Um, it's very strange and it's being quite widely researched actually as a um, possible means of pain control because if we can understand what's going on, we might be able to modulate pain. Um, but it, if you've never had it before and you, you just have a tiny bit in a sort of uh, hot and sour soup or something, it's quite a nice sensation. It just sort of makes you salivate. You don't realize what's going on. But if you take a, a bite out of it, you feel that your mouth is buzzing and then you start dribbling saliva everywhere. It's quite embarrassing. It's a great thing to do at parties with kids. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a nice comment here from Alan who's saying, my wife says pineapples at the entrance of houses were meant to mean welcome to. Uh, and then saying thanks for a wonderful talk. That's Thank you. Nice. Um, yeah, I, c I can. Um, uh, I, I think it was originally a sign of kind of, um, uh, you know, pi pineapples were just this craze. Uh, and, and in fact, at the beginning of at the end of the 18th century, beginning of 19th century, the word pineapple itself um, became a, a, a sort of byword for anything that was really wonderful, really, really special. And people used to say, uh, uh, the, um, uh, Charles Lamb, in fact, in fact, said, you know, um, it was talking about someone being the very pineapple of, of, of propriety. Um, or, you know, or you go to a party and it was a very pineapple of a party. It was fantastic. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, I'll take a couple of more questions, John, if you don't mind. Um, I, I, I don't mind. I, I can stay all evening, but, um, you, you know, you might just <laughs> want to stop at some point. <laughs> no, great. We'll take a couple. Of, it's a couple of more in the in the in the chat. So so one um, question is, so how many countries um, have you traveled to? when you researched your book and out of those countries, was it one that was your favorite? Um, uh, no, well, uh, asking about which is your favorite is like asking, um, uh, you know, which is your favorite child or something. But I, I, um, uh, I, I, I didn't just go to these countries researching a book. In fact, I didn't realize I was going to write a book when I was mostly traveling and I was traveling with, with work quite a lot. Um, as a documentary filmmaker, and then I travelled with, with Kew Gardens um, on expeditions and things where they were quite happy to have a trustee making coming along making films about what they were doing about their plants. So I travelled quite a bit with that, um, and of course I've been a tourist in, in countries as well. Um, I uh, uh, I suppose I have a sort of particular love, uh, even though the country is going through an a, a patch that is irritating me at the moment. I, I have a particular love affair with India. Um, 
uh, for a whole lot of reasons, um, partly because, uh, you know, we have a big Indian population in London and, and so there's something kind of pleasantly familiar as well as being kind of exotic about it. Um, and uh, it's incredibly varied and, uh, you know, and I like the food and the music and, and so on. Um, in terms of plants, um, uh, the, uh, one of the plants that I, I really like, and I, I, I'm just going to share my screen for a second uh, because uh, I can just put up this one um, again for just a moment. Um, can you see that? Yeah, yeah, we can yeah. do that. Uh, okay, uh, so um, uh, there's me in front of this uh, plant, which is called uh, Allodendron dichotomum. It's the grown up big brother or sister of, of the aloe vera that you're familiar with. This thing is about 40 feet tall. This is on the border between Namibia and Angola in the Namib desert. And um, it looks smaller than it is because I'm actually quite close to the camera. And one of the reasons I love this plant uh, is because um, it's got this sort of white coating, a bit like those beetles, waxy coating, which uh, defends it from ultraviolet light. Um, and uh, the reason I love it is not because it thrives here in the desert, you know, one of the driest deserts in the world, uh, but because this waxy coating means that people sort of come along and, and, and touch it and stroke it, and it's got this lovely tactile feel. And the second reason I love this plant is that it's the national plant of Namibia. So when anyone sees it, it's like driving a Morris Minor, everyone smiles at you. So the thought of being a plant that everyone uh, looks at and, and sort of smiles and wants to stroke, I suppose that, that, that's one of, I'm, I'm not sure it's my favorite plant, but one of, um, if I was a plant, maybe that's the one I'd like to be. <laughs> good, good answer. Um, one more here from, Amy, who says, do you think there's a way to predict the occasional terrible effects of using living pest controls, like in the prickly pear example? Um, sorry, I, uh, it, it just, my audio just cut out for a second. Can you just but, repeat the question? I'm yeah, sorry. I think the question is, do you think there's a way to predict the occasional terrible effects of using uh, okay. living pest controls, like in the prickly pear example? It, it's it's really hard, you know, because, you know, we live in such complicated webs of life. Um, ecosystems are very, very compli complex. And, uh, you know, especially when things are a bit under stress because of climate change or because of the way that we're, you know, altering habitats or, um, you know, uh, all, all sorts of things that, that cause stress in an ecosystem anyway. And then uh, if you add in a perturbation, which is, you know, like uh, adding in an extra insect or, or, um, or tree um, that doesn't have any predators, uh, then that can make a huge difference and can outcompete the other things. Um, so, you know, uh, there are lots of examples of this. There's uh, the, the so-called tree of heaven or tree of hell in, in the United States, which uh, has spread all along the sort of railway lines around the country and is very, very difficult to eradicate. Um, we have rhododendron in this country, which some people like, but in, 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 in the right place in the garden, it's great, but it's not, not fantastic in, um, you know, because it takes over so much and, there's, and, it, and it, it, it is a reservoir for disease. Um, you've got the water hyacinth that was introduced by the Belgians into Africa. And in the Amazon, it's fine because there are little weevils that eat it. But, you know, uh, now there are huge parts of Lake Victoria which are unnavigable, but just because so much of this stuff has, has grown over the surface. Um, it's, it's, so the, the answer to the question is it's very, very hard to predict. Very hard. And I think actually uh, I, I mentioned um, uh, harboring disease in rhododendrons and one of the diseases they harbour is Phytophthora. And I see there's a question from Campbell Christie about potato blight. Um, did it come to Europe with the potato or did it evolve here? Um, uh, I believe that the um, uh, Phytophthora infestans um, uh, is, is actually uh, something that is uh, kind of, uh, you know, around in, in many, many parts of the world already. And uh, what the you know happened with potato blight was that one they just had one variety of potato which is not sexually um, reproduced but vegetatively reproduced by taking tubers and planting them they're all genetically identical um, so that uh, anything that attacked one plant would attack all of them 
And the, the saddest bit about potato blight, people think that it's a story about the vulnerability of cloned plants, but it's not. Um, to me, it's about man's inhumanity to man, because there was plenty of food in, 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 um, uh, in Ireland at the time. Um, a million people died, two million people emigrated, um, uh, but because the food was being exported to, to Britain uh, and uh, Ireland was a colony at the time. And I think that that informs um, a lot of the, uh, uh, the sort of present politics and feeling. Uh, you, you can't imagine that it wouldn't in the same way that the opium wars um, uh, affect uh, the, the sort of Chinese response to criticism of Hong Kong um, for good or ill. Thanks, John. I think um, Amanda just had one last question, and she's wondering if there is any hope for our um, office plants, um, <laughs> or if they can be revived, or if there if there are a time when you kind of say that's that's probably the end. Uh, it's still got some leaves on it. I, you know, maybe you could um, take it away from the office and put it somewhere where it would rather be. Uh, give it some <laughs> um, tender, loving care and. I'll take it home. I'll take it home. I think that's the, <laughs> we'll see what I can do. <laughs> I think that's, um, I think that might, I hope we have answered. It's so many thanks in the chat and people saying so fascinating and, and going to go on and, and, and um, buy the book. But I think we covered all the, all the questions um, in there. Can I, can I, can I just uh, finish by, by sure. first of all, saying thank you for, for having me. Second, um, every if you do buy books, then uh, if you if you do it within the next, um, uh, you know, by by tomorrow night, um, then we can actually get those signed and dedicated if you want. So do it through the website, and they'll tell you how to do that in a minute. But the most important thing, I mean, is is what Amanda started with, which is actually, you know, everything that we're talking about pales into insignificance. Um, beside the importance of education. And uh, if, you know, it, I'd much rather you contribute to the, um, you know, the, the bursary fund, uh, which pays off over generations and generations. It's the most amazing investment that you can make, uh, really. Um, uh, I'd much rather you do that than buy the book. And do both, but, but you know, really, um, that, that's the thing to do. Thanks, John. Well, actually, by buying the book, um, the money will go to the bursaries appeal. So it's it's uh, it's kind of a win-win, a win-win. <laughs> yeah. um, but as said, thank you so much uh, for that fascinating hour. And of course, thank you to our audience for your excellent questions and for making this evening so enjoyable. Uh, as Amanda mentioned earlier, if you would like to catch up uh, on any of our virtually speaking events, uh, there is a link in the chat now um, that you can copy before you leave. Uh, next Tuesday, so the 4th of May, we have Bill Emmett returning to continue the discussion from his previous talk in February on the politics and economics of the post-pandemic world. And he will do that together with Latma economics and politics teacher Paul Goldsmith. So should you wish to join that event, please copy out the link in the chat now. That brings us very sadly to the end of tonight's um, event. But thank you so much from all of us here at Latima and enjoy your bank holiday weekend and hopefully see you very soon again. Good night. <laughs>